all tied together for the third principle, which is what Voss called the redemptive principle. He said revelation is inseparably linked to the activity of redemption. Revelation, what God is showing us in His Word, is the interpretation of redemption. To see revelation properly, we must see it in its redemptive context. In other words, God is not just saying, here's some facts about my attributes. Here's just some commands for you to know. No, He's revealing things within a redemptive context. He told us that from the beginning. Here's what I'm going to have to do to rescue fallen humanity. And in that context, we are understanding this. The context and the content of some revelation may be in seed form. The full message of the atonement is not in every passage. It may be in seed form as it relates to redemption, but it is integrally related to the mature message and is not properly understood or communicated until this relationship is made clear. In other words, what Voss is saying is, you can say many true things about a passage and still not explain its real meaning until you have related it to its full redemptive context. Now, how is that possible? I mean, just, just an example. Imagine, again, in that Midwestern town in which I taught for a lot of years, the fall of every year, you would find a lot, of, a lot of acorns on the ground. Now, just imagine that I was trying to explain to people from other nations, let me tell you what an acorn is, all right? An acorn is this, this nut that you find on the ground in the fall, and it kind of is pointy on one end and has a little cap on the other end, and the cap is corrugated and darker color and has a little stem on it, and the, the pointy end is, is shiny and, and uh, slick, and squirrels gather this in the fall and they eat it in the winter and, 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 and that's what an acorn is. Now, I just said many true things about the acorn, but I neglected to tell you something that you must know to really understand what the acorn is. What did I neglect to tell you about? It's a seed, it's a seed of the oak tree. If I do not mention the oak tree, even though I've told you many true things about the acorn, if you don't understand something about the oak tree, you really don't understand the acorn. Just, just saying true things can be sending right information and still sending wrong signals because you don't know what this relates to. Now, here's another acorn. Okay? This acorn is the commandment, you shall not steal. Now, I can say to you, this occurs in the Ten Commandments. It occurs again in the New Testament in, as Paul is addressing those at Thessalonica. Stealing is bad. You should not take big things. You should not take little things. You should not even take another person's reputation. If it is not yours, you may not take it. Stealing is bad. Don't do it. All right, let's have the benediction. <laughs> he said, no, 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 wait a second. It, it, there might be something missing here. What? Well, yes, stealing's bad, but, but if I really understand everything about the commandment, you shall not steal. A holy God has said to you, you may not ever take anything that is not your own. If I really understand the holiness of this command, what do I understand about the nature of the God who gave a holy command? What do I understand about God from His commands? I understand that He is. He's holy. But if I really understand the commandment, you shall not ever take anything that is not your own, not even another person's reputation by speaking ill of them without cause. You may never take anything that is not your own. I understand God is holy. What do I understand about myself? I'm not. God is holy and I'm a thief. And there's a problem there. And there's a problem I cannot fix any more than a man with muddy hands can clean a white shirt. I cannot fix the problem. So what does the Apostle Paul say about the commands? The law was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. I understand I'm not my own redeemer. If, if all I do is I say to people, stealing is bad, don't do it, and the benediction, they are not blessed because the command can only create two things in the human heart. If I say, you must not ever steal, one response would be the rich young ruler, right? Which is, well, I haven't. 
You know, got it all done. But if I really understand the command, never may you take something that is not your own. The other human response is not pride, it is what? Despair. Despair. If there is not a redemptive context, there is no answer to pride or despair. And what what we have to understand is there is a redemptive context and our goal as Christian preachers and teachers is to make that context clear to God's people. The implications of a redemptive perspective, number one, divine provision is necessary for holy living. Since all Scripture is redemptive revelation addressing our fallen condition, that is our inadequacy or our incompleteness, then we must recognize in some way every passage points not only to our need of redemption, but also the passage points to God's provision of our redemption. After all, the Bible is not a self-help book. Would you agree with that? The Bible is not a self-help book. Now, I do this every time I teach this course. I've said that line for a lot of years. The Bible is not a self-help book. And one class after I said that, a student came to me a little bit later with a photocopy of the Bible he had at his desk. And here's what it said. I'm going to hide the publisher, okay? So it says the Bible, and I'll hide one. Can you actually see what it says here? It says the something Bible, and then it says what? Can you read that? The the self-help edition. And I, oh no, you know, somebody, somebody did not understand, right? So the, the self-help edition of the Bible. There is no such Bible, at least no Christian Bible that is a self-help Bible. Why? What did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and our goal is to remind people that there is this redemptive context, this, this gospel need, this Jesus need of every passage we preach. I'm not saying that every passage mentions Jesus. Hear me. I am not saying every passage mentions Jesus. But every text stands in relation to the development of God's redemptive message. And that context is always unfolding, which number two on this item C on your uh, notes makes it clear biblical theology is necessary for proper interpretation. John Calvin said it this way, We must gather that to profit much in the Holy Scripture, we must always resort, go back to, our Lord Jesus Christ and cast our eyes upon Him without turning from Him at any time. You'll see a number of people who labor very hard indeed at reading the Holy Scriptures. Now, in John Calvin's time, reading was the equivalent statement of preaching. So they're reading it out to people. Okay. You'll see a lot of people who work very hard at reading the Holy Scriptures. They do nothing else but turn over the leaves of it. Can you just see it? They're just turning pages. And why? Because they do not have any particular aim in view. They only wander about, although they've gathered together a number of sentences of all sorts, yet nothing of value results from them. Even so it is with them that labor in reading the Holy Scriptures. And do not know which is the point they ought to rest on, namely the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a center point. Now, by that I do not mean that that Christ is in in the book of Psalms right in the center. Now, certainly there are prophetic Psalms, but I'm not saying that Jesus appears in every passage. That's not the point. But there is an unfolding purpose, a central aim of the Scriptures And it's to point God's people to the necessity of a Redeemer that they must call upon for their hope. And this is leading us to a redemptive interpretation that the Bible itself tells us is necessary. Now, for many biblical theologians, 1 Corinthians 2.2 is absolutely essential for our interpretation. There the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.2, you know this, I resolve to make nothing known among you. But Jesus Christ, and what a good person he was, and how you can be good too if you try really, really. No, is that what it says? I resolved to make nothing known among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's not just your performance, but his provision, his atoning work that the Apostle Paul said, I resolved to make nothing known among you. But Now, we almost want to debate Paul. Say, well, that, Paul, you talked about lots of other things. 
you know, marriage practices and giving practices and, and worship practices. You know, talk- but apparently the Apostle Paul believed he had a hub for all of those spokes, right? The core message was still the work of God in Christ with its many implications, which is why he said, I resolved to make nothing known among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And in the preceding chapter, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Now, is any Jew going to be upset that Paul says you should not steal? No, that's that's not upsetting. You should be faithful to your spouse. Is that upsetting? No, that's, that's not upsetting. What is the stumbling block? You have stolen. You have been unfaithful by being dependent on anything but Jesus Christ. It's the the referring to Christ. It's the stumbling block of the necessity of the cross that was the upsetting part of Paul's message. And so he said it's that essential message of the atoning work of Christ that has to be core and key to all other messages. Luke 24, 27, it's not just the Apostle Paul. Think how Jesus himself echoes this. Remember what's happened? This is called the road to Emmaus. So after the resurrection, Jesus appears to some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And for reasons we don't quite understand, they don't recognize him. But Luke tells us about the conversation. And Luke says, beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, Jesus revealed what was said in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, does that mean Jesus said every verse mentions him? No, but he's saying they they all center on the purpose for which he would come. They all are pointing to his necessity, if not to he himself in his person and work. And, And that message becomes absolutely essential because if, think of this, if Jesus himself is saying, all the scriptures are pointing to me, then if we are proclaiming the scriptures without mention of him, we're failing to do the very thing Jesus said the scriptures were about, to explain the very thing that Jesus said the scriptures were. We're not following his own interpretive method. And for that reason, we are again trying to identify redemptive context. All of this is pictured for us in Matthew 17. Now, that's the transfiguration. So, before his crucifixion, Jesus appears in glory on a mountaintop in a cloud. And and who appears with him? Do you remember? Moses and Elijah. Elijah. Moses represents the law law and Elijah. Uh Now, now can you picture it? They all come to give honor to to Christ. He is the apex of what has preceded. So he is in the glory cloud, but appearing with him is what is given testimony to him. Moses and all the prophets, and, and that reference now is made plain even visually for the disciples who are witnessing the transfiguration. Jesus would say, even to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures. So what are they looking at? The Old Testament. You study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you will find eternal life. But the scriptures, he said, testify of me, Jesus said. We're simply trying to interpret the scriptures the way Jesus did, the way the apostles and prophets taught us to interpret the scriptures. There is a redemptive context. Now, a keynote at the bottom of of your notes there. These verses demonstrate that the term Christ-centered is synecdoche. Synecdoche means part for the whole. We are not trying to say the whole message of the atonement appears in every passage and chapter of the Bible. No, that's that's not the point. But but Christ-centered is saying there's a part of the whole message that is unfolding, that is being revealed. So Christ-centered can can be gospel-oriented, redemptive-themed. I mean, there's different ways that people talk about this. So Christ-centered is synecdoche for all of God's redeeming work that makes us know and depend upon His grace ultimately provided in Christ. A Christ-centered sermon does not attempt to make Jesus appear where the text does not speak of Him. You know, sometimes the title of a book can get you in trouble, Christ-centered preaching, and people think, you know, I'm going to make you take out your magic wand and make Jesus appear, or your decoder ring. Well, let's see, the verse has you know, six letters and, you know, there's two testaments, you divide by two, and so it's the Trinity, you know. (laughs) 
No, we're not doing that. That, that That's not what we're talking about. We are saying there is an unfolding revelation of the human predicament and the divine solution. And that is what we are making clear when we talk about a message being Christ-centered. A Christ-centered sermon does not attempt to make Jesus appear where the text does not speak of Him, but rather demonstrates the relation of the text to His person and or work. So these are sometimes called redemptive messages or grace-focused messages or um, grace-principled messages. We're, We're saying, what are the grace principles that are here that will ultimately culminate in the work of Jesus Christ? I think of how the Apostle Paul addressed the Ephesian elders when he knew he would see them no more. And what did he say to them? He said in Acts 20, The Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's our task too, to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Our goal in Christ-centered preaching is not to make Jesus magically or allegorically appear in every text, but rather to demonstrate the grace principles. What are the principles? How is God providing for people who cannot provide for themselves? What are the grace principles evident in the text that are most fully revealed in Christ's person and or work and are necessary for our growth in Christ's likeness. I mean, if apart from Him we can do nothing, then that gospel enablement should be part of our message as well. For we have to recognize that we cannot grow in Christ's likeness apart from Christ. Now, saying that sounds so easy. But we recognize when I'm in an Old Testament passage or maybe just a commandment, say, well, I don't necessarily see Jesus there. So we're going to spend all of the next lecture talking about how do we develop Christ-centered messages and be fair and operating with integrity expositionally in every text. But just to get us ready, just for a little bit, let's talk about the nature and design of non-redemptive messages, messages that are not seeing things in their biblical context, because it may just help us get ready for what we need to be doing. If you think about the nature of non-redemptive messages, they are always some form of what I will call sola bootstrapsa, right? You've heard of sola scriptura, this is sola bootstrapsa. It's some form of you just lift yourself up by your own bootstraps and things will be okay between you. And and nobody means to say that. But by eliminating the grace message, eliminating the redemptive truths, and just focusing on human behavior, these are inevitably sola bootstrapsa messages. And they come in various forms. Nobody says pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. I I hope not anyway. But there are the the 10 steps to a better and, and fill in the blank. Relationship with your neighbor, relationship with your, 10 steps to a better prayer life. You know, go to a darker closet, <laughs> uh, use more words, spend more time. And, you know, we might as well be Hindus, right? And take out our prayer and just spin it more. Because if you're not careful, just, just every way in which you break through the ceiling to get your prayer to God is just something you do more of. And the notion that Christ is at the right hand of God interceding for you, and apart from His intercession, you have no right to enter the throne room of God. You know, that doesn't even get on the page. It just becomes sort of a little eye of newt, you know, hair of lizard, and we throw it in the pot and get the God in the sky to respond to us. Now, ultimately, all of these solo bootstraps are saying, you do this thing or this behavior to get yourself right with God. And the basic problem with these messages is these are not merely sub-Christian messages. They are actually anti-Christian messages. Nobody means that. You know, I, I don't mean to preach against the gospel. But if all we are saying to people is, you fix your relationship with God, we are actually undoing the Christian message. We would say every other religion in the world has some form of you reach up or you reach some state of mind to get yourself to God. What does the Christian message alone say? Not that we reach up to Him, but what? He came down to us. And if all we are saying is you just do more stuff, you do better, you do deeper, you do more, we don't mean it, but we're actually preaching against the gospel. Since no scripture in context says you just be good and God will be happy with you. I mean, it happens so easily, and some of it is a consequence of our own stereotypes. 
I mean, if you will, in our, in our Christian subculture, we, we typically have identification of what we think is balanced Christianity, right? And so we know over here is, is legalism, and we know that's wrong. And uh, we know that over on the other side is some form of, of liberalism or, or license, and we know that's wrong. And we think, you know, balanced Christianity is, is somewhere in the middle here. But I want you to really think about the theology that we are teaching with such a model. After all, what does legalism teach makes you right with God? It's usually things that you don't do. What, if you're a true legalist, what, what must you not do to be okay with God? What are some things in our kind of Christian culture? They say, don't do this and you'll be okay with God. What's it? Yeah, so, you know, don't, don't, don't smoke, you know, don't drink too much, uh, you know, don't go to bad movies, you know, and, and, and we, you know, we have these lists of don'ts. What does a true liberal say will make you right with God? What are the things that you should do to be right with God? So we will say various forms of social action and care. You know, uh, you, should, you should be kind to the poor and the orphan and uh, those who are, are suffering. So these are things you should do. And, and we say, you know, this is just a, a, a social gospel and this is just a legalistic gospel and they're both wrong and so balanced Christianity is in the middle. What we have to recognize is as different as these may be sociologically, theologically, they're exactly the same thing, right? The spectrum turns back on itself because whether you're a legalist or one who says what you do in terms of good behavior and good social justice is what may... Both of these are saying you make yourself right with God. It's what you do. It's your performance. And what I'm at pains to say is Christianity cannot be found on that scale. It's not dependent on what you do. That ultimately Christianity is at its core with the gospel dependence on what Christ has done, which we respond to in love according to his word. What that means is if we begin to truly perceive the nature of the gospel, is there are some messages that just as familiar as they may be to us are actually out of bounds for Christian preaching. Some of you have had me in other contexts and so you've heard this before, but I'll just say it's, it's what I identify as the deadly bees. The messages that are so readily uh, coming to our lips and messages but are actually spiritually deadly. You've heard of the killer bees. Right? These are the deadly bees. And these spiritually deadly bees, though they, they sound so good, when we even have a text that we think backs us up, these actually are hurtful to people. The first form of deadly bee messages are, are bee-like messages. We point to the behavior of some biblical character and we say, you should be like that. You know, you, you should be like David. He, he, you know, he beat up the lion and the bear and he went up against Goliath. And, you know, Goliath said, am I a dog that you come against me with a sling? And David said, you come with sword, javelin, and spear. I come in the, in the name of the Lord. And you can beat up the Goliaths in your life if you just have enough faith. You should be like David. Well, except for that chapter about Bathsheba. And how he murdered her husband to have her. And then he raised bad kids. And then at the end of his life, he numbered his troops as though he were responsible for his own glory. Well, maybe you shouldn't be like David. But now Abraham, you know, now, now there was a truly good guy, right? He went to the land he did not know, obeying the call of God. And on that journey, he only gave away his wife twice to other men. And then because he did not have patience for the Lord's promise... He slept with his wife's maid. And then when of all things his wife got upset about that, he put his own biological son and his mistress in the desert to die of exposure. Well, maybe you shouldn't be like Abraham either. Actually, I think the Bible takes care to tarnish virtually every human figure so that we will come to a stark realization. There is only one true biblical hero in the Bible. Who is that? That is Jesus. 
and everything else is pointing to him. There are people who, despite how God used them, are terribly messed up and everybody needs a redeemer. Now, I have to say a few things very quickly here. Are there some people in the Bible that don't appear to be so flawed? You know, it says about Enoch, what? Enoch walked with God and he was no more. And you just can't get much dirt in there. I mean, it's just all it says, you know, it's all it says about Enoch. And Jonathan and Caleb. But I hope, first of all, you recognize these are exceptions. But even if we were to, were to acknowledge th these are wonderfully godly people, who enabled that? That was the work of God in them. Who is the hero of the text? It is still God. And one of the ways in which we check ourselves to say, is this truly a Christ-centered, a redemptive message, is just to back away from what we've just said to people and, and ask ourselves, is God the hero of that message or just some human figure? Because ultimately it has to be God's equipping, God's enabling that will give our people hope. Not just there were better people than they in another day. How is God the advocate, the enabler? That is the message of true hope. Now I have to be very careful. Does the Apostle Paul ever say, be like me, follow my example? Does Paul ever say that? Yeah, at least five times. Now finish the verse. Follow my example as? I follow Christ. There's a redemptive context. That's the point. Here's my little rubric for this. Be like messages are not wrong in themselves. They are wrong by themselves. If that's all we say, we are meant to learn good behavior from the biblical characters, but they function like the law. That is, it's necessary to know those behaviors, but it is deadly to base our acceptance upon them, right? Our acceptance with God is based upon Christ's work, His flowers in our behalf, not just the goodness of ours, which is always inevitably flawed in some way. Another form of deadly B are messages that are only B good. Now you say, what could possibly be wrong with a B good message? I mean, well, you certainly don't want to preach the opposite, you know, be bad. But what's the problem with saying, you know, Girl Scouts are good, and Boy Scouts are good, and Christians are good, and it's good to be good. It's bad to be bad. So be good. What did the apostles say? There is none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If my entire message is be good, don't steal, be a better person this week, only two possible human responses again are either pride or despair. I'll never measure up or I've got that box checked off both of which are spiritually wounding. The last of the deadly bees, which may come most frequently and easily to us, are messages that are entirely be disciplined. Be more disciplined than you were, right? So uh, pray more. Read your Bible more. Go to church more, especially go to my church more. <laughs> What's wrong with the more message? How much is more? How much more? My best works are only what to God? Filthy rags. God, how many more filthy rags you want? When are you going to be happy? How many? If you're trying to satisfy God with filthy rags, you will never satisfy Him or have hope yourself. Be disciplined messages are not wrong in themselves. They are wrong by themselves. If that's all we say, because we are telling people that their hope is in their discipline and their hope is not in their discipline, their hope is in their Savior. And we have to make sure that all of these things that we are calling God's people to do are a response to His grace, not a way in which they are earning or qualifying for His grace. There is a redemptive context. B messages by themselves imply that we are able to change our fallen condition by our own efforts. But such messages make us no different than Unitarians or Muslims or Hindus. Jay Adams says it so well. He says, it is easy to become moralistic when preaching. 
while there's nothing wrong with preaching morality, in contrast, moralism is legalistic, ignores the grace of God, and replaces the work of God with self-help. He then asked this terrible question. If you preach a sermon that would be acceptable to the members of a Jewish synagogue or a Unitarian congregation, then you must recognize there is something terribly wrong with it. What is wrong with it? It lacks a redeemer under than yourself. He says preaching when truly Christian is distinctive. And what makes it distinctive is the, is the all-pervading presence of a saving and sanctifying Christ. Jesus Christ must be at the heart of every sermon you preach. This is just as true, key words here, of edificational preaching as it is of evangelistic preaching. You see, we're ready to get Jesus into the evangelistic message, you know, every six months. <laughs> but he's saying, no, if you, apart from Christ you can do nothing then Christ has to be context and content interwoven properly from its redemptive context with every truly Christian message. Why? Item C in your notes. Because of the demerits of non-redemptive messages. Why don't these non-redemptive messages really help? Just be like, be good or be... Why isn't that sufficient? Number one, because there is no merit in keeping God's commands. Do you know that? Now, is there blessing in keeping God's... If I'm faithful to my spouse, is there blessing in that? Yes. Does God love me more because I love my spouse? No, because God's love is not based upon my performance, but upon my faith in Christ's performance. So there is blessing but not merit. All I have is filthy rags apart from Christ. Or even Christ's words in Luke 17, 10. When you have done all that you should do, when you've done all that you should do, he said, you are still what? An unworthy servant. Wait, I did all that I should do. But what you do is not what got you a seat at the master's table, but rather his mercy, his kindness, his grace. When you've done all that you should do, you're unworthy apart from the work of Christ. Again, Calvin, to man we may only assign this, that he pollutes and contaminates by his impurity those very things which are good. For nothing proceeds from a man, however perfect he may be, that is not defiled by some spot. Let the Lord then call to judgment the best of human works. He will indeed recognize in them his own righteousness by man's dishonor and shame. To our shame, most people, even in the church, are balancing scales. Oh, I'm not perfect. But you know, the good works outweigh the bad. What if they actually recognize what they think of as good works actually went on the bad side of the scale? That our impurity profanes, pollutes even our best works. The Westminster Confession of Faith says good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidence of a true and lively faith. Yet people's ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly from the Spirit of Christ. It's Christ in us. That's why we have to speak of Christ and have people depend upon Him. The, the last lines in that paragraph, believers being accepted through Christ, their good works are also accepted in Him, here the in Him, inside His righteousness, not as though our works were in this life wholly unblameable and even unreprovable in God's sight. Oh boy, I don't want to think that way. I thought my good works were making me acceptable to God. And yet we actually learned that our good works because of the pollution of our humanity actually could be brought in judgment against us were it not for the work of Christ. What this means, item two on your sheets there, challenges to holiness without mention of grace force a human-centered religion. If there is no grace in this message, it's just what I do to fix my separation from God. People cannot do what they are told to do apart from Christ's grace. That's what Jesus said. Requirements of holiness by themselves wound people because without provision of divine aid, they either will despair of hope or trust in their own righteousness. Thus, if you wound people, even unintentionally, by just telling them the stuff they should do, right? If you wound, even unintentionally, you are obligated to heal. We heal 
by wedding all requirements of holiness to a proper relationship with him who alone can provide holiness and showing where and how the scripture we are interpreting does the same. Think how the Apostle Paul does it. I mean, he's never more strident in the command for holiness than in Ephesians chapter 6. Remember, put on the whole armor of God. But, but before he says, you know, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of right, before he tells all those things that we are to do, how does he begin? Be strong in the power of His might. Not your might, His might. There's a dependence relationship for fighting the good fight. And if we don't call people to that dependence relationship in every passage of Scripture, they just get dependent on themselves. And that ultimately will damage their walk with Christ. Here's, here's just today's conclusion. A way to think about it. We are going to tell people, rightly preaching, what God requires of them. But at some point, whether we are preachers or parents or counselors or teachers, those people are going to walk out of our office or sanctuary or counseling uh, classroom. We're, we're going to see them walk away to do what we told them they must do. As you watch them go, with whom do they go? Do they hold by the hand, me, myself, and I, we're going to get this done. Or do you send them out with the Savior? Because if you do not send them out with the Savior, you send them to darkness. But if you send them out with Him, you send them out with joy and hope that is their strength. We'll talk about how next time. For now, let's just remind ourselves, apart from Him, we can do nothing. Let's send them out with Jesus. Jesus.